So today we're starting a totally brand new unit on electrical principles. This one is actually a very interesting unit. It's also our last unit that we're going to cover this year. Let's get started. So we begin our final unit today, electrical principles and technology. This unit is unit D in the textbook. So in other words, we have jumped around all year. The last unit we did uh, was of course unit A. It was very beginning of the book. This one's near the end of the book, of course. I just felt like it would be uh, a better approach to go through it a different way. Now the beginning of these, this unit deals with how electrical energy can be transferred and stored. So in other words, how can it be moved from one place to another, or how can it be held in one location uh, for an extended period of time? Now our focus for today will be looking at static electricity, okay? And I'm sure you've heard of static electricity before, of course. With this, we're gonna look at what electrical charges are and how they behave. We're gonna look at static electricity itself. We're gonna look at static discharge, which is probably what you think of when you think of static electricity. Then we're gonna look at charge separation and then we're gonna take a quick look at Van de Graaff generators. Here we go. So before we begin though, let's recall a few things back from the chemistry unit from earlier on in this, uh, in this year, right? All matter is made up of atoms. Atoms contain three primary components, the protons, the neutrons, and electrons. Those are very important to understand, especially as we go forward in, in this electricity unit. Now, protons and neutrons are located in the nucleus, or in other words, the center of the atom. They can't move. In other words, if you have an atom of chlorine, for instance, those protons and neutrons are not gonna go anywhere. Those protons and neutrons are actually what determine what uh, an element really is, right? So chlorine will always have its same number of protons and neutrons. Carbon will always have its same number of protons for sure. Neutrons can change, that's, that's where it gets a little bit different. Neutrons uh, can disappear. That forms something called isotopes. You don't need to know that for now. But protons in particular, they don't move. They kind of, well, dictate what an atom actually is, right? Now, electrons, however, they're the ones that surround the atom, they kind of buzz around in circles here, right? Now, electrons can be gained or lost to form something that we call an ion. An ion is just a charged atom, right? So if you gain electrons, you're gaining more negative pieces. In other words, you're becoming more negatively charged. But if you lost your electrons, in other words, they just went, went somewhere else, right? Then you become positively charged because you're losing your negative piece. Some people think that's kind of backwards, but that's just how it works, right? Now, electrons can be passed from one atom or ion to another, right? So in other words, electrons do bounce around. They go from atom to atom. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what electricity is. Now, we're not, we're not going to look at that today. That's called current electricity. It's where electricity is flowing but we will look at what happens when something does have more electrons or less electrons than it usually would. Okay, next up, opposites attract. I'm sure you've probably already heard this before as well, but we're gonna break it down a little bit more advanced uh, for science nine. Protons are the elementary particle responsible for the positive charge and electrons the elementary particle responsible for the negative charge, as we've just discussed. Now, if an object has gained electrons, then it becomes negatively charged. So in other words, if something has a negative charge to it, really that just means it has an abundance of electrons. It's got more electrons in it than it has protons, okay? Now, if an object has lost electrons, it becomes positively charged, right? So it's lost some of its negative pieces, it's gonna become more positively charged. Uh, the presence of an electric charge creates something called an electric force. This is really big when you go into physics, believe me, but an electric force can either attract or repel the two charged objects. This is where the old phrase opposites attract comes in. Two opposite charges are gonna attract each other. So in other words, the electric force is going to push these two charged objects together because one's positive, one's negative. They really wanna to stick together. But if they have the same charge, or in other words, like charges, then they're gonna repel. They really, really, really don't like each other, right? So if you had two things that were positively charged, they're gonna be pushing away from each other. And the same idea if you had two things that were negatively charged, they would push away from each other as well. And again, the word we usually use for that is repel. Uh, this, by the way, the whole idea of opposites attract, this is called the law of electrical charges, the idea that opposite charges attract each other and like charges repel each other. All right, now finally into static electricity. As the name suggests, static electricity is a type of electricity where the electrons are not presently moving anywhere. In other words, they've just been kind of dropped on something. They're being stored in an object, right? So in other words, uh, static electricity is where an object has either gained or lost a substantial number of electrons, okay? Now, I just thought, just a real quick, easy example, because uh, I'm sure all of us have had this happen, of course. When your hair has static, 
each strand, of course, stands up and away from the others. And it gets really annoying, of course, when you get staticky hair like this. Well, what's really happening there in terms of a scientific explanation is every single one of your hair strands there has the same charge. Now, whether it's a positive charge or a negative charge, that's harder to predict and really it doesn't matter. Let's suppose they were all positively charged. Since all of your individual hair strands have a positive charge, by the law of electrical charges, they're going to be repelling from each other. That's why they're sticking up. These hair uh, strands are all being repelled from one another. So in other words, they're being repelled away from the bulk of the rest of your hair. So they're being pushed upwards. And then while they're upwards, they're still also all pointing away from another because they're individually each all uh, repelled from each other. They're not attracted. It's the opposite of attraction here, right? Uh, so since they're all charged in the same way, they repel each other. That's why we have uh, issues with frizzy, staticky hair, right? Moving on. All right, discharge. Objects don't really like holding on to an electric charge. So in other words, the fact that they have either gained or lost electrons, is just uncomfortable in terms of how nature wants things to be. Things like to return to a normal, neutral state whenever possible, right? Uh, in order for that to be possible, you have to minimize the distance between two oppositely charged objects in order for there to be something called a static discharge. So for example, if you rub your feet on a carpet and then you touch something, especially something metal, because metal conducts electricity really well, so it's going to be a, a really good recipient of the electrons you built up, um, or the lack of electrons, depending on how it works, right? Again, it, it can be harder to predict whether you get a positive or a negative charge. And just to make it clear, a positive charge and a negative charge in terms of how uh, like electricity will discharge, it's just exactly the same thing, right? So in other words, I could rub my feet against a carpet and then touch something metal and get a shock. It would work the same way whether or not I picked up a positive charge or a negative charge from that carpet, right? It doesn't matter. But anyway, that's an aside. So this jolt of electricity you get from touching something metal when you picked up some static electricity from the carpet is called static discharge, okay? It's where electrons move from the more negatively charged object to the other object, in other words, to balance out. So if you became negatively charged by rubbing your feet against the carpet, what would happen when you touch something metal is those electrons that you picked up from the carpet all at once suddenly discharge into the metal object that you touched, okay? So that's why oftentimes, especially if it's like a dark situation you're in, like if you're in a dark room, you can literally see a spark. What you're seeing there in that spark is electrons flying from one location, whether it's you or the metal object, uh, to the other, right? Now, let's look at the alternate situation. If you rub your feet against the carpet and you gain a positive charge, when you touch the metal object, the electrons are actually going to you, okay? It doesn't feel like anything different. It just, you know, it's just a different way that the discharge is happening. And again, it just comes down to semantics. All right, next up, charge separation. This one's weird. A less obvious behavior of static electricity comes from the interaction between a charged object, so something that carries a charge, and a neutral object. Let's consider a situation where you have a balloon and you've rubbed the balloon on your head uh, and then you have a wall, right? So the balloon, by rubbing it on your head, has gained some sort of a charge. So the charges have gotten there from the friction of you rubbing it on your head uh, and your wall should hopefully just be neutral, right? So the balloon, however, will still stick to the wall, even though the wall isn't electrically charged, right? The, the wall is totally neutral. You didn't charge the wall and the fact that there's electrical outlets in the wall doesn't mean the electric charges are going to the wall, at least you certainly would hope not. You'd certainly hope it was wired correctly and that there's not electricity flowing through your wall. But, but still, uh, your wall is neutral. Your balloon has some sort of electric charge. Well, why do they stick together? You know, you think opposites attract, but these aren't opposites. One's, you know, maybe negatively charged and the other one's neutral. Well, this is actually coming down to a principle called charge separation. Here's how it works, okay? You're going to want to listen to this one because it is a bit weird. I'll show you a picture in a second as well as a cool little game thing that I, that I found. Uh, the wall, of course, like anything else, contains protons and negative electrons, the positive protons and negative electrons. So in other words, there's an equal balance, positive, negative, positive, negative, negative, positive, negative, positive, right? So the wall has an equal balance. It's got positive pieces and negative pieces, okay? Now, your charge balloon is going to attract the opposite charges in the wall. These charges, even though they're not going to leave the wall, are going to align in such a way that they are going to be conducive to having this balloon stick to the wall. Let's say the balloon was negative, okay? There's a bunch of negative charges in that balloon. Well, the negative balloon, as soon as it comes to the, the, the neutral wall, all of the positive pieces in the wall go, hey, wait a minute, there's something negative here. We're attracted to that. And meanwhile, all the negative pieces in the balloon go, oh, there's a negative thing here. We're repelled from that. So what really happens, if I just erase all this, what really happens is all of those positive charges go, hey, there's a balloon. 
and they all line up near the balloon. Whereas the inner side of the wall, so imagine like we're going into the wall now, all of those negative charges are backing off, right? They're getting further away from that balloon than, than they were, right? This principle here is still called charge separation. The wall remains neutral, right? The wall is not charged now, it just has a separation of charges, or in other words, it's polarized. That's another way we could say it. It's a polarized wall now, um, in that there are charges on one side and the other. Okay, so this makes the wall serve as an electric equivalent of a magnet, even if only while the balloon is on the wall. If you remove the balloon, these charges go back to normal. They mix and mingle again, they go back to how it was, right? So it just kind of serves kind of like a magnet, and that's kind of weird saying it's an electric equivalent to magnet, because magnets actually operate off the same principle. It's called electromagnetism, but we don't need to know that right now. Uh, but still, the wall behaves uh, kind of like a magnet where the charges have lined up, okay? We'll, we'll deal with this a little bit more here, just watch. So uh, here's another like side view of what's happening. Again, we have a negatively charged balloon that's brought up against a neutral wall, because notice it's neutral. There's the same number of positive and negative charges, right? There's no net charge on this one. Um, but what happens is when you bring the negatively charged balloon close to the neutral wall, all of those positive charges line up and the negative charges flee away, right? Because these negatives are repelled from the negative here, whereas the positives are attracted to the balloon here, okay? That's basically the idea. All right, here's something kind of interesting. I just found this actually like right as I was wrapping this lesson up when I was making it, I was like, oh, cool, it's like a gold mine. I found this demo, it's an online demo and I'll post the link on Google Classroom. You can give it a try if you want as well, but I'll show you what it is. It basically shows this principle, here we go, of uh, charge separation. So of course in this demo here, you can see there's like a sweater, right? And then we got a balloon and then we got a wall. Now before I do anything here, you can notice that all of these objects are already neutral as they should be, just in nature, things just remain neutral unless otherwise charged. Uh, there's an equal number of positive and negative charges in all of these objects, okay? Now let's take this balloon here. Um, oh, and before I do anything, let's bring the balloon up against the wall. Notice, like, it's sticking, but it's not being attracted to it. Like, if I bring it really close, nothing happens. It's just sticking there just because I placed it there. That maybe isn't the best way of showing it. Um, but first things first, though, it's not being attracted to the wall. And again, it's only moving because I'm pushing and pulling it, right? Anyway. Now what we're gonna do with this balloon is we're gonna rub it against this sweater. And I want you to watch what happens to the charges as we do this. If I take this balloon and put it up against a sweater, I can start picking up all of those negative charges. So now, and I'm, just, I'm still holding my mouse just by the way, just so, so you can see. Now, right now, uh, you can see the sweater is now totally positively charged because we've rubbed this balloon up against the sweater and we've picked up all of those negative charges. Meanwhile, the balloon, of course, is very much a negatively charged balloon. There are way more negatives in there than there are positives. Now notice the positive charges in the balloon, as you can see, there's the little red dots on the balloon. They weren't able to transfer. That comes back down to what I was saying earlier about how the positive pieces, the protons, don't actually get transferred. The only thing that moves is the negative electrons. Now, again, as I kind of very briefly mentioned just a second ago, I'm still holding my mouse down, like so I can like click and drag this. Watch what happens if I let go of my mouse, especially if I put it right here. It's attracted, right? I didn't move it there. Hopefully you can see my mouse pointer. I didn't move it there. I'll move it back and then I'll let go of it. Yeah, it's very much attracted to it. That's because there's negatively charged, uh, negative charges sorry, on the balloon and positive charges in the sweater, right? So they're naturally going to be attracted to each other. And that's the same thing that would happen if you tried this in real life. If you, if you rub the balloon against a sweater, woolly fabric works really well for this, of course. Uh, you are going to find that the balloon is going to be attracted because, again, it picked up all of those negatives uh, from the sweater and it's storing it in the balloon now itself. Now, what I'm really getting at here, though, is what this is going to have on that uh, neutral wall. So notice, again, we haven't done anything with that wall yet. It's totally neutral. But if I bring this balloon closer to the wall, watch what happens. Notice all those negatives are moving away and the positives are staying put, right? So in other words, that's the effect of charge separation. The negatives are moving away leaving only the positives left over. Now, if I like let go of my mouse, maybe right here. There we go, yeah, it totally did snap in. Uh, when I have it close to the wall, it's still going to be attracted to the wall because there was a point at which there was enough charge separation that the wall acts like a magnet and gets it in. I wonder if there's a point where I can like meet it in the middle. No, see there it was attracted. I'm trying to like see if I can just hold. No, what about like right here? No, still it's more attracted to the sweater. Interesting. It's like a breaking point somewhere in between. Here's what I'll do though. I'm posting this on Google Classroom. You can play around with it on your own. Um, it doesn't even require Java, so it should be 
uh, usable on most computers. But again, very, very cool, really interesting application. All right, we're almost done here. Uh, next thing we gotta talk about really quick is a Van de Graaff generator. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen me in class play around with these, because again, with physics, uh, I, I use this quite extensively. So uh, hopefully this isn't the first time you're seeing this, but a Van de Graaff generator is advice used to study static electrical discharge. So again, where there's a spark that flies from one thing to another. Uh, how it works is there's a rubber, rubber belt uh, that rubs against a comb in the base. So the rubber belt is located in like the stem part of the Van de Graaff generator and it moves and it moves and it moves. And while it's moving at the bottom down here, there's a comb that is uh, basically putting charges on the belt. Now usually, it all depends on the setup of these, but usually the belt picks up negative charges. I have heard of some where the belt actually gets positive charges, um, but still it, it really is just a matter of subjectivity. It doesn't really matter in terms of what we're learning here, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, it, it still works one way or another. The charges behave the same general way. But anyway, so the belt rubs against the comb, picks up those negative charges, we'll say, and then brings them to the top, and there's a comb up at the top that takes those negative charges and puts it into the metal sphere that forms the globe up at the top, right? Now, what can happen is anything that touches that metal sphere will then gain those charges itself. So in this picture here, here's the girl who's touching the Van de Graaff generator, and her hair, like before, is uh, sticking up in all directions, because again, if this thing has a negative charge on it, then that means she's picking up all these negative charges, and if she's picking up all the negative charges, they're gonna go to her hair, and all of her hair strands are also going to have negative charges, right? And that's why they're sticking up and out away from each other. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Like you might have to turn the resolution up. Her hair is pretty fine, but um, still, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, all the hair strands are being repelled because they all have the same charge. All right. Anyway, here's a little experiment you can do in your own time if you have the materials and if you wish. All you'll need is a plastic comb and a kitchen or bathroom tap. What you need to do is just turn the tap on to a very gentle stream, right? So like literally just barely turn it on so there's a consistent stream of water coming out, but not very much. Like we don't want like a full tap going here. Also, we don't want it dribbling, so we don't want it doing like the blah, 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 blah thing, you know, we just want like a little very light stream of water. Take your comb, then comb your hair with at least 10 strokes. So like comb, 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 comb at least 10 times. And then take the comb and hold it near the gentle stream of water without actually touching it. I want you to see what you're gonna notice from that. I'm not gonna spoil it for you. I'm not gonna tell you what you're gonna end up seeing, uh, but you're gonna see something happen. And I want you to think, how can you explain what you noticed using what we covered today? So in other words, what happened and why did it happen in terms of a scientific explanation thing? protons, electrons, neutrons, all that jazz, right? Uh, how can you explain what happened today or with that, with what we've learned today, okay? All right, so from pra for practice here, this is what I really want you guys to do as well. Uh, page 278, questions one to five, and then questions seven and eight. So in other words, just skip question six. Uh, again, we can go over these on our Zoom on, uh, on Friday. Wait a minute. No, there won't be school. There won't be school on Friday because when you guys are watching this, uh, May, May 11th, I believe, is when this lesson is supposed to air. Uh, that Friday is May 15th, and that is scheduled as a school-based PD day. So in other words, no, we won't have a Zoom this week. Um, interesting. There you go. Uh, the PD day, of course, means no classes for students. Teachers will still have uh, professional development opportunities to go to, uh, so we will still be working. But uh, other than that, your work's cut out for you for today. So anyway, these questions on this page. Uh, and again, if you want to play around with that balloon sweater simulation thing, I'll post it on Google Classroom, and you're free to play around with that as well. Anyway, best of luck, guys. You know how to contact me, uh, and I'll talk to you soon.